Freedom. Because uh, freedom is a word and uh, uh, a lot of different meanings can be uh, uh, can be uh, behind this word and uh, I'd like to start with some probably definitions because freedom is itself is, is just a phenomenon to be explained and uh, uh, it's a, a phenomenon that we deal with in our lives and uh, what is lacking or probably not lacking, but what is a very, uh, uh, what can be very, what can vary very broadly is the different explanations of what uh, we uh, perceive as freedom. And uh, uh, the such words as determination, self-determination uh, that are used in the title uh, it's an, uh, an attempt to uh, approach to some explanation. And I'll start with some definitions and I'll start with the uh, initial point of determination because first of all we become aware of the determination of our activity and later come to the idea of some freedom. Historically in human history, people first become, have become aware of a lot of different pressures and factors and influences and determinations. And uh, then, somewhat later, they have come to the idea of the possibility of some freedom. Uh, uh, if, we, uh, if we look at the beginning of human history, uh, we'll see that uh, uh, the idea of determinism as divine determinism was total in early human societies and uh, well in ancient Greek mythology say the attempts to uh, behave uh, against the will of the gods was a very serious challenge and uh, was possible only for uh, those heroes who were somewhat related to gods, that were uh, uh, the offsprings of divine family uh, in this or that way. So evidently the freedom as such was uh, uh, treated as a divine gift, as a sign of divinity. No mortal, totally mortal, uh, could, uh, uh, could, uh, uh, exer uh, could exercise some, uh, could go against the will of the gods. Only the person with some divine blood, so to say, of some divine origins. So, uh, determine, uh, I uh, give a very, very uh, mechanical uh, uh, description of determination about the, so the, the connect, connection between some set of processes and uh, the, uh, the key explanatory concept is necessity necessarily takes place uh, and uh, I'd like for, uh, to uh, uh, tell that uh, it, 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 it's not like logical necessity. It looks like a logical formula, but uh, the necessity is not of logical origins because if we uh, take some syllogism uh, from A necessarily follows B, so uh, the necessity uh, the necessity here is meant according to the criteria of truth. Is something is true, then other <laughs> then the, the consequences is necessarily also true. But human behavior is uh, built according to quite different principles and uh, I can uh, tell you, well, you say that 2 plus 2 equals 4. I tell you that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Well, you, you tell me that I am wrong. Well, let it be. 
let me be wrong. I, I agree to be wrong. I will behave as if 2 plus 2 would equal 5. Uh, so freedom in this context is the concept expressing the belief that human activity is not totally determined or pan-determined, as Viktor Frankl said it. He noted that human life is determined but not pan-determined, that is, there is some space for freedom. And uh, uh, it follows from here that, uh, uh, well, uh, this belief can be interpreted as uh, true or as false. There are some conceptions that treat freedom as just an illusion. We have such, a, such an idea of freedom and we are sure that we are free, but in fact we are not. Uh, other approaches uh, uh, allow uh, for some true freedom that is some space free from being totally determined. But the very important uh, thing is self-determination. Because, um, well, uh, Mario Bunge, a philosopher uh, who has written a, a very thick book on causality, uh, he noticed a very important thing that uh, uh, where uh, not everything is totally determined, but most of the processes probably uh, they uh, have some uh, uh, some uh, instances of self-determination, that is, uh, that uh, w it's not determination that is absolute, uh, but some self-sustaining processes that uh, can influence themselves, that can support themselves, and this is the more fundamental fact uh, than uh, uh, causal determination between different processes. And uh, here I introduced the very uh, important idea of the inner world. So, uh, the uh, so human being possesses the capacity of self-determination just uh, because we possess such thing as inner world. And inner world is something uh, that, uh, 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 that only human beings do possess, uh, unlike any animals. And uh, this accounts for, for the gift of freedom as uh, a uniquely human gift. What is inner world? Individual imaginary picture of the world, including the uh, picture of being, non-being, possible, impossible, desirable, undesirable. That is, we don't, don't only, we not only reflect the world, the environment, the reality as it is, but we can construct imaginary worlds. We may uh, uh, get any ideas that have very little, very far reference to something we watch in, we meet in reality. So the consciousness not only reflects the world, so that's why I don't want to, to speak about mind, because mind is uh, something reflecting the environment, but consciousness is something creating the worlds, creating the inner world. And, uh, well, uh, uh, probably the, the, the best illustration of this idea, well, I found uh, yesterday in, well, I just, it's not that I found, I knew it long, I found in Karl Marx writings. So, uh, the worst architect differs from the best B in that before actually building his edifice, he has already built it in his mind. So this is the issue of self-determination. First, uh, initial are uh, the facts of inner world. So we built some project, some edifices. Well, uh, Sartre's concept of project, a project is also very, is fits here very well. And uh, so, uh, some consequences from those uh, point, from uh, those definitions. I already mentioned some of them. Uh, I 
uh, I would not dwell on many theories and theoretical discussions. Uh, in the second half of 20th century, they took the form of what was uh, designated as hard determinism versus soft <coughs> determinism. Hard determinism, uh, well, a kind of behavioral version presupposes that everything can be controlled, conditioned, and de causally determined. And soft determinism, different approaches to find how we still manage to be free uh, uh, and not just have an illusion of freedom, but uh, an attempt to find some mechanisms that account for some true freedom in uh, the organization of our behavior. And uh, uh, the, uh, I'd like to summarize the main findings, the main uh, ideas uh, in five in five points. Uh, what uh, what uh, can be uh, what can be treated as uh, what, what makes human freedom possible? Because I believe that freedom is not just an illusion. Uh, some authors. Uh, who wanted to see uh, to see uh, 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 just an illusion of freedom rather than true freedom? They said that well, if we knew all the determinants that uh, act upon us, we would uh, get rid of this illusion. We think that we are free only because we don't know everything that determines us. But in a sense, it contradicts to, uh, to the regularity known in psychology as fundamental attribution error. In fact, uh, this regularity means that uh, in the position of self-observing uh, self subjects, we, uh, my, uh, we see uh, the uh, external determinants much easier than the possibilities of our own freedom. When we observe another person, we can see his or her freedom much easier than the factors uh, uh, acting upon his or her. And uh, this regularity contradicts the explanation of illusory freedom. On the contrary, it's easier to see uh, ourselves as determined in an illusory way. The illusion acts in opposite direction. Uh, and uh, the last point I'd like uh, to, to, well, uh, how is human uh, freedom possible? The first point is uh, I, I, I link here two different concepts from quite different contexts. Multi-level organization of human activity. Uh, it's an academic uh, concept linked to uh, cybernetics, synergetics, and so on and so on, and self-transcendence is purely existential idea uh, treated as a basic uh, human phenomenon, the basic uh, uh, the basic feature of human nature in general. Like quite a number of authors, including, for instance, Viktor Frankl and Amadeo Giorgi, and a number of others. Uh, those two ideas are uh, connected in a very interesting way, just because uh, uh, what 
is transcendent and where is it transcendent. If uh, we uh, can imagine the uh, human activity, human relation to the world, not as a linear process, but as a multi-level structure, uh, then we can see that we can transcend the regularities acting at one level when we ascend to a higher level. And it, uh, the, there are very simple illustrations of this, say the airplane, aircraft, uh, it, it, does not, uh, it does not cancel the laws of gravitation when it flies, no. Uh, it just adds some new levels, some new regularities, uh, aerodynamics uh, that uh, that up, uh, that build some new level, some higher level that uh, supersedes the lower level of uh, gravitational regularities. Just add another set of principle, another set of figure of regularities. So. The result is that it flies as if the gravitation would not exist, but it does exist and does act, and it's very important to consider it in the construction in a very precise way. So uh, yesterday during my workshop I quoted this wonderful uh, idea by Hegel circumstances or urges government only to the extent to which he allows them to do so. This is the idea of transcendence. We may stay at the level where uh, circumstances or urges govern us or to ascend to a higher level, not to allow them to do so. And uh, a kind of complicated description of this multi-level structure by Aram Hare a uh, very prominent British psychologist and philosopher and sociologist, the author of one of the most convincing theories of human agency. Uh, so uh, a description I would not dwell upon it. And uh, so Victor Frankl's dimension on ontology is very close also uh, to this idea, Frankl describes several uh, levels at which human relations to the world can be uh, built and uh, stresses that uh, in order to overcome the necessities, the givenness, the facticity existing at biological, psychological levels, we may ascend to a higher level, native or spiritual level, and uh, at this level we may find some other options, some other possibilities that help us to behave as if those uh, regularities at lower levels did not exist. The second point is uh, breaks of determination in the stream of human activity. In fact, uh, is uh, human is uh, the natural causal determination overall. This is the key problem because the main arguments against uh, the reality of human freedom uh, put forward by natural scientists were that it, it, it is not possible because it can never be possible if all the material world is causally interconnected, everything makes one uh, system of interconnections and everything causally determined, there was some overall change, then where is the, the, the space for human freedom? How can anything be not determined? But uh, several decades ago, very mighty arguments have come to us, the proponents of freedom uh, from natural sciences, from uh, the study from the inorganic chemistry, the works by uh, Ilya Prigozhin, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, uh, who studied uh, the process, uh, the chemical process, and he and who opened the uh, bifurcation points 
so uh, the, he started the process, he found that there is a kind of processes, even in inorganic nature, when the causal chains break, there is a possibility, there are two options. A process may take one of two possible directions. And there are no factors, no causes that would determine which of these directions the process would take. It's the point where determination breaks and uh, uh, it's just uh, a matter of chance, random uh, processes, which of the two directions the processes will take. And if even in inorganic nature there are such points, there are such moments, then in, it's quite logically to assume that in human behavior, in human life, also there are some points, and we may uh, introspectively notice the points, so some periods when, uh, our, uh, when our stream of life, stream of activity, takes quite different directions. <coughs> Certainly we may stop and change it, but we must uh, 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 do it with some effort, but there is some uh, regular course of the process. But at some points, there is nothing like a, a regular uh, self-going, self-sustaining course of the process. And we may uh, watch those points of bifurcation, of indeterminacy in our own life. This can also uh, provide an answer to the question on the role of personality in history. Certainly there are historical laws and regularities that act uh, independent of any uh, personalities that even uh, are very influential personalities. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, it's not true that a single uh, person, a general person, may turn, completely turn the, the uh, course of history. But in fact, it depends on the point of time. There are some stable periods and there are bifurcation points in human history. And in those bifurcation points, the role of personality becomes very significant. And in other periods, it is not especially important. It depends on the point in the process. And uh, about this break in, determ in determination, uh, uh, if we come back to to the psychology, to the psychology of personality. I'd like to recollect a, a brilliant idea by Rollo May. The locus of human freedom is the pause between timeless and response. Uh, I usually say to my students that the, the uh, first, the, 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 the simplest and probably the most powerful existential technique is stop and count to 10. Uh, or to 20, it doesn't matter. Stop and count to 10. So when you stop and count to 10, you break the chains of determination. And May said that it's this pulse that allows us to throw our own weight to the, uh, to, uh, in favor of this, of that response, and, and so on, and so on. But this pose is a very important thing. Uh, in ancient times, there was the idea of the wheel of fate, and ancient hero was a person who had the power who, uh, to break, to, 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 uh, to leave uh, this wheel of fate, to do something not predetermined, not uh, 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 expected of him, 
but to do something completely unexpected, unpredicted. And this was the this was the essence of the ancient hero. And one more thing, uh, one more thing uh, wisely noticed by a, a person. Uh, well, I made a mistake that I didn't uh, write his name on transparency because it's a very complicated name. But uh, this is uh, uh, this person that is not not very well known in in the West. He died 12 years ago. Merab uh, Mamardashvili, philosopher, Russian philosopher of Georgian origins. Well, uh, he is the philosopher of the rank. Uh, well, uh, as well uh, as uh, actually everyone who knows his writings uh, would confirm that he is the philosopher of the rank of of Hegel, Plato, and Heidegger. And uh, after his death, every year a new book of his, based on his, on the transcripts of his lecture, appears. And uh, uh, he proposed a completely new kind of what I call post-existential or radical existential philosophy. It's not like uh, the uh, mainstream existentialism of the 20th century, but it's uh, another stage of its development. And Mama Dashvili uh, told. In, in his lectures uh, in philosopher about uh, he has given his interpretation of Hamlet what Hamlet does this well known phenomenon of Hamlet that a lot of psychologists try to interpret why Hamlet hesitates all the time just because he does not want the, the circumstances <laughs> the situation urges him to respond to stimuli to behave according to the logic of situation, the logic of social expectations, so on. He does not want to do it. He hesitates. He does, he has to do something. Uh, he does it, in fact. But he, he does not respond, directly respond. He makes response. He tries to, 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 uh, to get away of his will. And uh, sometimes, uh, well, in general, in general, he fails. But what he is really doing during all the uh, all his uh, history is just trying, trying to get away of his will of fate, to make those pauses, not to respond to time. The next point is. Uh, activity mediation by creative consciousness that constructs multiple realities. Uh, so, in fact, uh, I already mentioned about this, and I <coughs> probably I will not dwell uh, upon it uh, more uh, than I had because not so much time is left. I'd like to refer to Salvatore Medi's theory about the foundations of human free action, what he calls psychological needs in symbolization, imagination, and judgment. This is something that gives us freedom from our biological and social determinants. Why? Just because it allows us to construct in a world, to construct realities, and to live not only in the world of facticity, but also to uh, consider the possibilities, the possibilities that cannot be deduced directly from what is going on. We construe them. So uh, I uh, made an, in, an experiment with school graduates, middle school graduates, uh, trying to to influence, to organize the process of choosing their career, of vocational choice. And uh, I found that the process of constructing possible futures is a very important chain, is a very important process that accounts for the uh, effectiveness of their vocational choice. The fourth important point is uh, the value basis of free action, because 
you know the rather old distinction of freedom for versus freedom from. It's not enough to be free from any constraints and uh, determinants, but it's important to have something, some value justification, value basis, what for to be free to provide some free actions. That is organizing principles of one's own. Uh, that is, we are not using, uh, we are not taking for granted some organizing principles that can be uh, proposed to us by, say, morals, religions, other people's society and so on. That is that a free, really free person must elaborate a guiding value principles of one's own, of his or her own. And this is what uh, Carl Jung uh, designated as the principle of direction of personal maturation. To elaborate the guiding principle of principles of one's own. Here is a quotation from Nietzsche, who introduced this distinction between freedom from and freedom for. Are you calling yourself free? Your leading idea is what I want to hear, not just what you th uh, that you've thrown off your yoke. Do you belong to those who have the right to throw off your, the yoke? There were many of those who had lost their last value when liberated from the slave. Uh, and uh, another contemporary author, Joseph Richlock, uh, uses, so introduced the concept of telesponding as opposed to responding. Uh, so uh, a kind of proactive activity directed at the goal, telos, but the main point that uh, is stressed by Richlock is that uh, the essence of human will, uh, free will and responsibility is just the same elaboration of, elaboration of one's own guiding principles. Uh, and uh, I would also uh, point at uh, the uh, well, at the etymology of one well-known word, word, autonomy. The etymology of this word means a law of one's own. Greek, Greek, ancient Greek meaning of the word autonomy. A law of one's own. Personal autonomy means having one's own guiding laws. The fifth point uh, deals with instrumental resources of freedom. That is, it's not enough to want to be free and to have a belief in freedom in order to be free and to behave freely. Uh, Mamardashvili said that uh, spiritual actions like the exercise of freedom must be based on some on some muscles. So uh, a small child must have a wish to lift uh, to lift a table, but he he is unable. To lift a table. He wants but uh, hasn't enough power to do this. So, says Mamardashvili, uh, we, it's not enough to want to behave morally in order to behave morally. We must have some intellectual, spiritual, uh, psychological muscles. It's a very important point. It's not just a matter of goodwill. Goodwill is necessary, but not enough. 
and uh, we must have some resources to use some resources to to make our uh, to make ourselves free so um, there are uh, there can be different kinds of resources uh, uh, to lean on in a choice situation in a freedom situation external resources internal resources and uh, uh, it's a matter of degrees of freedom, uh, how many options we have. So, uh, you see, in fact, uh, the number, uh, well, our own, uh, our own resources account for the, uh, the breadth of possible options we will have in a choice situation. Say, uh, well, if I, a person, a person who, uh, in many situations, say, a person who who can speak uh, foreign languages have more possibilities usually uh, uh, as compared to the person who, who doesn't speak foreign languages. A person who can swim has more possibility as compared to the person who can swim and so on in corresponding situations. So some of the skills, some of the uh, skills uh, can be of use more often, some less often, but uh, any of them give some uh, additional degree of freedom. But the, uh, the peculiar situation with the resources is that they both make us more free and less free. Because many of our resources, well, essentially all of our resources that give us some additional possibilities, they try to enslave us. There is one uh, principle uh, that I uh, managed to, did use to formulate not long ago, and uh, every, every week I see new and new confirmations of this regularity and principle. Uh, that is that all the resources we have, everything that makes us more powerful, more free, more potent, at the same time always, always tries to enslave us, to submit us to itself. It's very evident in case of money, of power, and of authority. It's quite evident. It's long known. But this is also true for such resources as knowledge, wisdom, relations, sexuality, uh, affection, virtue, uh, essentially for everything. I called it Tolkien principle that is best exemplified in the image of the ring, Tolkien's image of the ring. It gives enormous power, but it enslaves us. What makes us more powerful does always try to enslave us. So there is a struggle. It doesn't mean that it does always enslave us. It always tries. Such a tendency is always there. But we may struggle with it. We must not necessarily give up. And if we are aware of it well enough, well, what I mean by enslave? So, enslave uh, just to, to reduce the person to this resource only. So, say uh, a wise scholar may be so proud of his uh, wisdom that uh, this wisdom enslaves him and uh, he completely dissolves in his wisdom. His per, uh, there is nothing more in his person besides his wisdom. This is the example of this slave, so the Tolkien principle. And uh, and uh, these are the main points that uh, 
uh, I think it's important to consider when trying to explain the possibility of human freedom. Now a couple of words, uh, of words about developmental aspects. Probably I'll take five minutes more uh, just because we started too, too late. Just uh, uh, to complete what I was going to say. Uh, so we come to purely psychological issues, how to promote the development of uh, human freedom. And I, I treat freedom as a higher mental function, according to Lev Vygotsky. He defined higher mental functions as uh, the uniquely human functions that uh, are, uh, uh, that have some special, some uh, special uh, uh, properties. Uh, higher mental functions are always uh, social by their origins, mediated by their structure, and uh, voluntary by the way of their functioning. So these are the controlled functions. So uh, there is, a, a, for instance, a voluntary attention uh, that exists only in humans that uh, differs from regular involuntary attention that is also there in animals. Uh, there are some processes as uh, uh, voluntary memory, uh, and uh, there are more complicated processes that different authors interpreted of, uh, in, in terms of higher mental functions. And the, the way of development, uh, the way of ontogenetic development of higher mental functions is the way uh, that they first, first uh, uh, they appear in the interaction, in the parent-child interaction, and uh, the child uh, makes some uh, influence upon, or the parent makes some influence upon the child. Say, the function of uh, attention develops in the following, uh, following steps. First, the uh, a parent points to a child to something. Then the child learns to point for a parent to something. Then the child learns to point to oneself in an external uh, overt fashion. And then the, all, the whole process gets interiorized, as we go calls it, and the, the, the uh, function, the internal function of uh, voluntary attention grows. So, I, uh, for instance, I studied the same, uh, the same succession for such function as humor. It also develops according to those, these, those steps as a higher mental function. Uh, so the freedom uh, passes the same way and the initial, the initial stage is the nature of spontaneity, uh, but it's just the uh, genetic root uh, uh, and the real human freedom goes through a very complicated Way. The second point about the development of conditions that promote the, uh, the self-determination capacity and human freedom, and uh, a number of authors have pointed at those conditions, and I have a possibility, a happy possibility, to refer to a poster that will be presented in the afternoon today, uh, uh, authored by Yelena Kalitievska, my wife and me, that deals right with this developmental process of human freedom and development, uh, um, uh, deals with their crossing in adolescent age, uh, uh, deals with adolescent crisis as the crossing of freedom and responsibility in their ontogenetic development. Uh, so I can skip the details and uh, the uh, development of conditions favorable for, uh, for, for, for this function as uh, uh, pointed out by a number of authors are emotional acceptance uh, of the child 
encouragement of his her activity, initiative, and providing some structure. It's an important point. Structure or limits as uh, uh, some authors uh, called it. Uh, freedom is not possible uh, without limits. There must be some limits that make the freedom possible. Roll may pointed at this moment. I found very interesting uh, considerations in a book by Dorothy Lee, cultural anthropologist. The book called Freedom and Culture. Uh, one of her books and another called Valuing the Self. And this is a comparison of different cultures, mainly uh, mostly North American natives, uh, but not only them. Uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, she, she, she found that what uh, we usually treat as limitations, restrictions, uh, in fact, it what makes it is a, uh, a structure that makes freedom and activity in general possible. That we could not organize our own activity to make it goal directed without some structure, some, well, so to say, limitations. So, and adolescent crisis is the crucial point, so I invite you to have a look at the poster. It's, uh, it's, it's not common for existential psychology from in, in the academic community here in North America, in the United States. Well, uh, so it's something marginal, uh, but in fact, uh, it, is, it must not necessarily be marginal uh, and I, uh, I, I uh, uh, the point is probably that uh, the traditional psychology deals with human person in, in the aspects where we are determined and our behavior can be predicted and calculated and it's 90, 95% of our whole activity but there are some uh, 5 or 10% uh, where we appear as free persons, as self-determined persons, unpredicted uh, through any constellation of factors that can be objectively described, assessed and calculated. And this is the space for existential view on human being, existential psychology, that, d that is not an alternative to the traditional psychology, but uh, it's a very important uh, addition uh, that, uh, that complements the traditional uh, objectivistic psychology. And so in order to understand human being fully, we must consider both and to combine those perspectives. So I think that's all. Thank you. Yes, to determinism. 
and in that sense, it is not a, 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 a duality. It is not an antagonism. It's it's a possibility. And I, while I find a lot of the arguments that you make about freedom as a possibility at the event level very interesting, I think we're forgetting a much more fundamental freedom. I completely agree with you. The point is not the time uh, presenting freedom determinism issue as a duality. It's just a matter of structure to make some points clear. And if I had more time, uh, I could speak, well, the whole day about all those issues. Uh, we would come to this again. Because what, uh, what I did was uh, uh, some probably necessary, probably, uh, I suppose necessary analytical procedure in order to, to, to get some idea of the freedom and to make our words as precise as they uh, can be in order to speak about freedom at all. But in general, as far as the general relation between freedom and determinism is concerned, I definitely agree with you. I never said that they are opposed and they may stick dichotomy. I, I did not say the opposite also either, but uh, uh, just I, can, I, I can't say everything about freedom in, in 40 minutes. <laughs> I would say freedom is multi-level too. Yeah, yeah. From yeah. self yeah. yeah. Certainly, experience. certainly. I took only some of aspects that I considered probably the, the most important at the, here. Initially, yeah. Yeah, just a short one, a very simple thing. Uh, you're talking about Hamlet, his reluctance to bend to mm -hmm. social conventions. Uh, the social conventions in North American culture is sometimes very different from what I would like to ask about. In, in that case, I would like to know how to use this existential freedom to achieve simplicity, public modesty, absence of possessiveness, readiness to respond to the needs of society, deep hostility to acquisitiveness, and high spirituality alien to social values. Uh, well, what a list is this? What, what, what That's is? my list. I uh -huh. think this from uh, various meetings. Well, uh, frankly speaking, uh, uh, Is it possible in this culture, in the North American culture, in your estimation? You see, uh, I think it, uh, well, I, I don't know, I don't talk to North American culture, I cannot, uh, uh, I cannot uh, respond for, for the North American culture, but in general, the point, well, what is, what is uh, uh, crucial for the, well, in order to be free, I, I can, I, I, I must not uh, uh, automatically accept, uh, accept cultural uh, norms and expectations, nor uh, or, well, uh, uh, no uh, rebel against them, reject them, and, and so on. So uh, we, we, well, a free person filters everything. He, uh, he or she takes what she, uh, she or he considers to, 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 to be worthwhile and uh, rejects the rest. So it's a... You're saying it's within the structure and it's got certain limitations that is not. In fact, in fact, Social, social uh, expectations and social uh, structures are also multi-level. So there is no society, single society. We live in a set of social structures of different range, and uh, uh, some of them, uh, well, are parallel to one another. Some of them include others. For instance, for us, as we grow. Family is the first society, and the family gives the first set of social rules and restrictions. Then we learn some other societies, a peer group, uh, well, uh, school class. Then we uh, uh, learn still more different societies, well, religious, community, professional group, and so on and so on. And each of those groups 
consists has uh, contains the whole set of values and uh, norms and regulations so, so that they may contradict each other or sometimes not contradict and then 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 we learn something about the national values and uh, rules then about the uh, all human so and uh, there is nothing like society like a single society there is society i, I live I don't live in a society. I live in a very in a multilevel system of societies.